So um, I'm going to talk about cash crop uh, yield gap reduction strategies. So in other words, strategies to reduce the yield lag that we normally see uh, for corn planted behind cereal rye, which is the most common cover crop. And so I'm going to talk from the perspective of conventional agriculture, but then make um, points that are applicable to organic uh, systems. So overall principles, things that we're trying to get accomplished uh, on farms is sustainable, sustainably intensified agriculture, right, which then fosters the principles of, <clears throat> number one, maximizing production and profit, number two, uh, maximizing nutrient use efficiency, and three, uh, minimizing environmental degradation. And that's something that's uh, applicable to both conventional or organic cropping systems. These are good principles uh, to manage by, right? So when you think about cover crops in the Midwest, on the North Central region, uh, cereal rice king, right? And it's kind of like cover crops that anybody can, can use, right? You throw it out there, uh, late, it grows. You throw it out early, it definitely grows. You, you plant in the spring, it'll grow, right? And so, uh, very good with nitrogen loss reduction. Very good with that. I would say also phosphorus. Uh, very good in, in uh, uh, photosynthetic carbon capture, right? Uh, as we were thinking about this emerging carbon market. And its original function that it's known for is good ground cover you see here. Uh, armor to reduce the impact of rain droplets that then detach soil particles and generate surface runoff. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, on a let's see. Okay, you can see that on, on a plot scale. You think about water quality. Uh, I did a study in Central Illinois, and we looked at uh, what's the impact of cover crop of cover crops, cereal dominated cover crop mixture, on uh, nitrate loss via tile drainage when you apply the nitrogen in the fall versus applying it in the spring, right? And we know that it's better to apply nitrogen in the spring because uh, you actually are applying it closer to when the plant has the highest demand for it, right? But then we also see that when, this, when we were doing this study, about 50% of farmers are still applying nitrogen in the fall. So we wanted to see if I add cover crops to the system, what would that do to fall or spring applied nitrogen? And what we found was that fall and spring were not significantly different from each other, but we got a 46 to 49 percent reduction uh, over time in cumulative nitrate load via tile drainage when you added cover crops despite when you applied it, right? And so this was on a plot scale. So then we, we then um, <clears throat> got funding to look at this thing, uh, cover crop impact on a watershed scale. And, and basically we found two large watersheds in central Illinois. Uh, we cover crop 50% of one of them, right? And so that's, that's the green. Uh, and then the non-cover crop watershed is the non-cover crop. So we, we pay for cover crops in the green, we pay people not to cover crop in the black, right? So that we can keep it as a solid control. And we looked at that over time, okay? We're about in seven years running. And when we start out, uh, we didn't see an effect of the cover crop on water quality, right? And so the thought is maybe um, residual or uh, legacy nitrogen effect is overcoming the cover crop effect. And then as you cover crop consecutively on the same acres over time, all of a sudden you start seeing some separation where we see lower um, <clears throat> concentrations for cover crop watershed relative to the non-cover crop watershed. If you took an average of the percent reduction of nitrate load over time, it's about 30 to 35 percent, okay? And this is when we cover crop only 50 percent of that watershed. So it's not full coverage, like on a plot scale. When you think about phosphorus, right? Um, this is what it looks like in that watershed uh, from surface flow. It's a grass waterway between two row crop fields. Uh, and it's a lot of sediment and phosphorus here. So does cover crop affect, um, you know, this water quality? We looked at subsurface, what about surface, right? And so we were thinking about that, and, and the idea is to figure out, you know, is uh, all, create, or all cover crop species created equal 
relative to, their, relative to their ability to interact with phosphorus. So we looked at basically um, different treatments. So we had a control that had received no cover crops over a nine year period, radish oats over a nine year period consecutively, cereal rye over a nine year period, and then annual rye. <clears throat> we looked at two different depths, uh, zero to four, I mean, zero to two centimeters, and then two to four centimeters, right? You're thinking centimeters. Yeah, that's right, right? The, the impact, what we call the, the runoff zone, the zone of soil or the depth of soil that really impacts uh, the concentration of phosphorus in surface runoff is about, well, we see about four centimeters. And so we took samples at those depths where we had consecutive uh, <clears throat> adoption of these cover crops over, nine, over a nine year period. We saw no significant difference uh, at the two to four centimeter depth in, in uh, the ability of the cover crop to reduce uh, phosphorus uh, desorption. But then when you come to the zero to two centimeter depth, the surface, more surface depth, we see that if you had radish oats planted, right, over a nine year period, that soil is more likely to give up phosphorus similar to the control. When you plant cereal rye, you, you significantly reduce relative to radish oats. When you plant annual, annual rye, you significantly reduce compared to cereal rye and definitely uh, significantly different from these two. Uh, that's the control and, and radish oats. One explanation for uh, annual rye being so effective is its rooting system. And so it assimilates phosphorus into a structure but puts it below the runoff zone, right? Causing there to be a lower concentration of phosphorus that the runoff interacts with at the surface. So <clears throat> water quality, check. We're doing a decent job there. But sustainably intensified agriculture has to include maximizing profit and production, right? So you can't have this without both of these being solid on, on, on farm. So when we go back to see right at Workhorse, this is what we normally see, at least when I do the studies, <laughs> right? And then when I looked at all of my colleagues uh, in the Midwest, uh, we did a, a meta-analysis and, and, and we see the same thing. We see about a 7% reduction uh, in yield for cereal rye following corn, right? Now, that's on average. There's some farmers who figured it out somehow, and they can plant corn behind cereal rye and be okay, right? But on average, you, you're looking at a yield reduction. <clears throat> then we begin to investigate why and when. What is happening? And so we did nitrogen uptake a nitrogen uptake analysis on the corn, above ground biomass, and we did that at different growth stages from V6 to R6. We found that at about V12, that's when you start seeing a separation or a reduction or deficiency in nitrogen uptake for corn in cereal rye residue versus the control. When you extrapolate all the way out to R6, right, when that plant shuts down, right, and starts to brown up and so forth, stops taking up nutrients, you're talking about a 60 pound per acre uh, deficiency that you have to manage for, right? <clears throat> Again, this is in conventional ag setting and I'll get to. And so then we, we got funding to do uh, a nitrogen tracking study. So we fed nitrogen to the cereal rye, we terminated the cereal rye, tracked it into the soil, we planted corn and soybean and tracked it into the corn and soybean at different growth stages from V5 to harvest. And then we found that mm, about 9 to 10% of what the cereal rye took up, right, in the above ground biomass actually uh, is used by the subsequent crop. So that means, let's just use 10. So if, I, if that cereal rye that you plant took up 40 pounds, your corn that you plant afterwards is only going to see 4 pounds. So cereal rye is very stingy. And that's what's relating to here, and here, right? All of this relates. <clears throat> these, all of these three are field studies. So cereal rye is good environmentally, but it might ca cause you to have to apply more nitrogen, right, to actually get the same yield. And it's, it's like, uh, do we want to do that? We're kind of like a negative trade-off there. So basically, I put together this cartoon to kind of help people understand this. Uh, this black line, uh, Above it means nitrogen is available. Below it, nitrogen is lost. So no cover crop situation, 72% of that nitrogen is, is in the soil, available above ground, right, in, in the soil. And then 
28% is lost through the towel when you don't have a cover crop present. You add a cover crop to the system like cereal rye, uh, it assimilates a large portion of the available nitrogen in the soil, and thus you have a reduction in nitrogen loss through the tile drainage. Great, right? And then <clears throat> the theory is, and we would hope, that a lot of this green, by the time we plant the corn, turns brown. It gives the nitrogen back and it looks like this. But actually what happens is, you might as well put this green below the line. It's just as unavailable as, tile, as the loss from the tile drain because you're only getting 10% back from what it took up. So that it leaves you with a 40 to 60 pound challenge that you have to manage for to make the playing ground even uh, in order to plant your corn, okay? And so <clears throat> that, that, br that brought uh, my group to the start of, we need next generation management that kind of helps us uh, to elucidate and to e increase our efficiency in nitrogen uptake for that corn. Because to plant cover crops and feel good about it and lose yield is just not sustainable. You can't call that sustainable. So we start looking at different practices. And I'm going to talk about two today, uh, but, but we look, you know, in our research, you, you might see other publications from our group where we're looking at end rate and end, end timing, okay? We're looking at, with colleagues, uh, planting settings, right? How does different planting closing wheels affect um, you know, our population, because a lot of times we lose yield and it might not be nutrient related. It may be just you got interference from the residue causing you to have a lower population and you lost yield when you planted, right, uh, in a high residue system. So then we're going to talk about today uh, pre precision planted cover crops. You heard some from one of my colleagues, uh, collaborators, uh, earlier this morning on that. And then we're going to talk about the inclusion of overwintering legumes, okay? Could we use this lagoon to get some nitrogen fixed from the atmosphere that then offsets what we need as fertilizer. And this is what we're looking for. So this is a small preliminary study that was done by one of my students. <clears throat> he basically, we had a Balanza clover stand and at planting he went in um, and collected samples at zero to five centimeters. And then we went back to the lab and put them in the incubator and said let's destructively sample over time and measure nitrogen mineralization. And lo and behold, what do we see? We have a control, we have cereal rye, we have balanza clover, right? Soil from those treatments, three replications from each dot that you see. And over time, as we simulate the growing degree days from uh, emergence all the way to R6, we see that the balanza clover is separating. So this is a mineralization, right, of roots, basically, because we took everything below ground, of roots from the balanza clover adding to the available pool of nitrogen that the corn can tap into. And so this is the kind of action that we want to see, but this is in an incubator. Does that translate to the actual field? Okay. And so we got funded, uh, Amir and I, along with Andrew Morganot, uh, by Sarah, and it's also funded by um, NREC. And we're looking at precision planting cover crops to improve profitability and environmental stewardship. Okay. And we have farms uh, across the state, uh, two states, Illinois and Indiana, and we're going to see some data from both. So this is our study framework. We have three, our treatments are made up of three main factors. The first is cover crop species. So balanza clover, that overwintering legume. We're trying to find an alternative to that cereal rye, right? Conventional or precision planted. Um, you, you heard about this this morning. Um, Precision planted is, we, we thought about, well, what if we plant the cover crops in precise strips across the field and then leaving a row for corn to be planted in the spring using RTK guidance, right? Depending on what type of drill you have and the spacing, you can get two or three rows of cover crops in between those 30 inch rows where the corn would go. What are you getting? None intersecting growing zones for corn and cover crops. So you can kind of reduce some of that carbon penalty and nitrogen tie up possibly, right? You're getting less seed rate because you're only covering 50% or so, uh, 30 to 50% of the area. Um, <clears throat> and you're, you're possibly, um, you know, increasing the soil tilt where you are growing, uh, where you have to come and plant your corn. So you don't have the residue cover. It, dry, it warms up fast. It dries out. Right, and, and you kind of like get the same kind of action as if it was tilled, 
Okay, so it's kind of like uh, we're tilling without tilling, right? Um, then the last factor is whether we use a full rate or a reduced rate of seeding. It's kind of determined how much seed do we really need. We treated each system, um, we treated each treatment like a system. So we didn't want the cereal rye to get above 2,500 pounds per acre of biomass, and we didn't want the balance, well, we let the balanza go to get good growth because we want to fix as much nitrogen as possible. So this, these are not good pictures, well, especially with the light shining on it. But one thing that you can see is in, you got to be patient. This is in central Illinois, Champaign County. Okay, uh, you come out there uh, after planting cover crops in December. You have basically nothing there, right? Uh, then March, then April, then here's April, and then April 29th. Uh, you see the significant growth in the month of, in the month of April, okay? Uh, what's in the cover crop biomass? What, what was the performance? So, so here's bio, biomass on this vertical axis, and then the two treatments, balanza clover and cereal rye, and then uh, we have full versus reduced rate, right? And then the blue is precision, um, full and reduced rates. So more of the story, when it comes to balanza clover, we got uh, right at, let's say, 1,200 pounds per acre of biomass, whether you planted a uh, full or reduced rate, uh, it didn't matter. So with 50% to 75% less cover crops planted, right, you, you really didn't um, see a difference in the biomass. So that means you can get away with less seed, right, and get the same biomass. That's a pocket saver. Uh, with uh, cereal rye, you saw the same uh, trend. Cereal rye actually had greater biomass because it's more cold tolerant uh, in central Illinois. And so you had a biomass range of, let's say, 2,700 uh, kilograms per hectare, but not, no significant difference as it relates to full or reduced rate or conventional or precision planted. So in the same manner, you can get away with, uh, you had less competition with 75% less seeding rate, so you got more biomass. That, that makes sense, okay? Uh, same trend for... Nitrogen uptake, on average, there was no difference across treatments, but on average, you had about 30 pounds per acre in Balanza clover. Remember that. That's in, that's in central Illinois. Okay? For Balanza, I mean, for cereal rye, no, no treatment differences, but about 50 pounds, 50, 55 pounds per acre on average. No treatment difference. Okay? So, this is significantly different. Not within cover crop species, but when you compare the two, the the C to N ratio, which is really important to you all, right? Uh, because that is the indicator of how fast the residue breaks down after it's terminated, okay? However you ter terminate it. And so Balanza Clover at about 10 to 11, uh, so carbon to nitrogen ratio versus cereal rye at about, let's say, 19 or 18 to 19. Significantly different, and this is, you ever wonder why corn stalks hang around longer than soybean? It's the difference in the CDN ratio. Corn stalks being about 60 to 1, um, soybean being about 20, 19 to 21 to 1. Lower CDN ratio, faster decomposition. Faster decomposition, more release of nutrients, right? So this is what it looks like May 14th when we planted, in, planted green into... Uh, the Balanza clover, okay? And so you're probably used to, used to looking at fields like that and, and planting into it, right? But the question is, is, is that profitable? Are we going to get anything out of that, right? And so uh, here's what we found with yields. It's a little messy uh, because we had some things that happened to us that year that we couldn't control, like voles. <laughs> we had a lot of vole damage because when you get that canopy, that is a habitat that could become a habitat. And this is cyclical, their impact. But one of the things I want to just point out, so here's the no cover crop control. This is, <coughs> excuse me, the system without cover crops. This is the conventional system that we normally would do. Cereal rye, full width, drilled, right? Drastic difference. When you think about Balanza clover, except for uh, uh, this one and, and this treatment, um, they're, they're not significantly different from the no cover crop control. And then look at this yield relative to this yield, 
what you would do. That's the difference. So to me, uh, if this was our gap, we are really closing the gap by just selecting another cover crop species that has a low CNN ratio to go before the corn. Even though it only had about 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen within it, but because of its low seeding ratio, it decomped fast. And I believe that if we wouldn't have had other problems where lower population and so forth, and that's management, we probably, most of these Belanza clovers would be on this side and most of the, the cereal would be on that side. So it kind of tells me there's potential that we need to rotate the cover crop before the cash crop. Put a low seeding ratio legume that fixed nitrogen, grows nitrogen, and releases fast before corn, and put uh, before your soybean something that has a higher, heavier seeding ratio that hangs around longer, right? So that was in central Illinois. We did a similar study in southern Indiana. What do you know about the difference, right? Warmer in the south, right? So uh, if you live in southern Illinois, you're going to like this a lot. <laughs> and so basically we had uh, different cover crop species, different planting methods. And then we went from zero to 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen. We treated each like a system. We had the precision planted also, right? And again, now look at the difference. You can expect more nitrogen in this biomass, but also more carbon, right? And so patience, patience. So in December, we're here. April, we're here. In the month of April, look at that. Look at this difference, right? So I heard some questions this morning about weeds. They're there. They're there. But then uh, you can see by the 15th of April, you're starting to, about to form canopy. And then here, you, you, you're dominantly outpacing the weeds except for a, a couple of dense, of dense spots. By the time we got to May 15th, this is what we look like. How much biomass is this, you think? Let's see. Let's 6,000 pounds per acre? Close. Very close. Very good guess. You might have heard me talk before. <laughs> okay. This is what we're getting below ground. What is this? Root nodules. That's where the bacteria is infecting the root and capturing nitrogen from the atmosphere. I mean, from the soil air, which that feeds from the atmosphere. There are worms there, right? So you, you got a good system going here. The question is, is can we convert the nitrogen from this system into the corn to get greater yield, right? Especially at low nitrogen rates, which is applicable to your systems. So this is 2021, okay? So yeah, we got on average 45, let's say 45, 60 pounds per acre. Uh, in that was almost 2,000 pounds per acre of carbon, okay? Uh, for the sea ride, let's say 2,400 pounds per acre with about 960 pounds per acre of, of, of carbon. Again, <clears throat> whether you precision plant or, or conventional, it didn't matter within, uh, across any other species. But we did see in the, see this, in, in the southern part of, of the state of southern Indiana, right, we did see uh, greater balanza clover growth relative to sea ride. But in central Illinois, it was the reverse. So where you are is really important, and it's going to affect your management. We'll talk about that later. We're talking about 118 pounds per acre of nitrogen in that biomass. That's just above ground. We haven't quantified what's in the roots. CDN ratio, 10, meaning that it's going to turn over fast. Cereride, we're looking at 45 pounds, which was equal to what we had in Central Illinois. Cereride is very stable. That's why it's the workhorse. No matter where you plant it at, it's going to perform similarly. But it has a seeding ratio of 23. It's going to return slower. So can we get some translation from this nitrogen into the corn? This is what it looks like when we plant it green, okay? Um, that's way worse than what we looked at in Central Illinois. It's scarier for some people. It was scary for me. And so we took some drone footage to kind of capture this because we wanted to know what was the impact of that. Does this have an impact on our corn yield? Because we know we have the nitrogen in the biomass, but could we get it out? All right. <clears throat> on this axis, we have the nitrogen we added to, to the system. 
This is what's relevant to you, right? Uh, all of it is, but here's zero nitrogen. Here are the seriotype treatments. No difference in precision versus conventional. Okay, slight difference, not significant. Here is the balanza clover, and here's the control. These three are not different from each other. But this is almost, that has to be at least 50, 60 bushels per acre greater just by choosing, uh, choosing balanza clover relative to seriotype. And it's making you not significant different, significantly different from the control. That difference stayed there. It persists all the way up to about 100 pounds per acre. Seriotype didn't catch up until you added 150 pounds per acre. But this ended up being the MRTM for the control and the balanza clover treatments. We didn't have enough nitrogen to get there for the seriotype treatments, right? Uh, one thing to think about, Almost 200, well, close to, well, between like 170 bushels with only 100 pounds of nitrogen. But no separation between the balanza clover and the control. And I think that this is because we had stink bugs, we had um, lower uh, harvestable ears because the, we were not able to get good seed to soil contact, so we lost some population. Right? But these are things that farmers can fix. What we're looking for is do we have greater potential for more competitive yields when we change this, the cover crop species before the corn? And we do see that potential. Okay? How do you terminate that? Glyphosate oh, and 2,4-D. Okay, you sprayed it. You yes. The cramp no, like no. That. But you, you could. There, there are those who do. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. It's a hollow stem. Y y yes, yeah. and you let it get into its reproductive stage, you crimp it, it it'll lay down nicely. And you got to plant the clover wheel. Oh, okay. You got, and you have to plant in the same direction that you crimp, or else you're going to have a mess. Okay. So yeah. if you crimp it and it lay down like this, you plant that direction. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> 2022, 5,000 pounds per acre biomass, right, uh, for cereal rye. 20, uh, 2,700 or so, okay? <clears throat> 156 pounds per acre of nitrogen in above ground biomass. We got it again, second year in a row. But this is in southern with more heat units. CD ratio a little higher, but not bad, 13 versus 10. Uh, and a lower CD ratio for the cereal ride with more nitrogen there, uh, 18 versus 23. But the, the trend is the same. We decided to plant brown green instead of green. You can see the difference here, right? You, you can see the difference. And we think that made a difference because now <clears throat> at zero in, we have clear separation between the balanza clover and the control. This is what we expected in the first place because if you have over 100 pounds of nitrogen in the above ground biomass, you expect some nice transfer, right? But we didn't see it because we didn't start the decomp cycle fast enough before we plant it. And I think that that's making a difference. We also, when we planted brown, I'm not showing it, had um, no significantly, significant difference or no difference in corn population. So planting brown, green, or into decomposing residue rather than uh, green, slippery, slimy residue, right? We got better population. Off the bat, we were gonna do better with yield because we got more plants out the ground. So even. you terminated the clover About two before weeks before, before. Yeah. yeah. So we were, we were real conservative in the second year because we didn't want to run into yeah, it. No till no right into it. <clears throat> so you can see separation. Now this year, uh, precision planted did better than um, conventional for cereal rye, right? and then it was not significantly different from the control, which is also a significant finding. Okay, and my colleague will find that several places uh, in, that he studies. And then the Balanza Clover was significantly different from, from these three. And we see that persist all the way up to 200 pounds. Again, the MRTN for all the Balanza Clover uh, treatment was at um, about 150 pounds per acre. That's the second time, it's two years in a row. And then uh, the no cover control and then precision ride was at about 200 pounds and then 
the um, conventional planted seed rye was at 250. Now that's a hundred pound difference. And nitrogen needed to get at the same yield. This is a 50 pound difference. If you consider the cost of the Balanza clover, right, uh, which is about three dollars and or so per pound. Let's say we apply 2.5, but let's just make it easy. We apply three pounds, right? So that's just nine dollars and something plus another 10 to terminate it. So you're talking about, let's say, $20 per acre for the management. What's the price per pound of nitrogen? You probably don't know it for uh, uh, inorganic. It's, it's a dollar. So we have a 50 pound saving, and to get there, we use 20 pounds. Everybody's doing the math? The cover crop paid for itself and put something else on your table. In this case, in this situation, at this field in southern Illinois. Now, what do we need to do to be better in northern, right? Uh, we got to start looking at early maturing soybeans. We also can look at um, can we come behind, if you have any wheat ground, you come behind wheat, right? And you can get that. Good growth from that clover. Uh, if you start it early, it'll grow. And that's what we are experimenting. We're also looking at like brassine clover to see if we can come in in March and then be patient and maybe plant first uh, of May to see if we can get at least 100, let's say 80 pounds of nitrogen in the above ground biomass. I think if we get that, we may see similar. Um, situation. So we're trying to be really creative to figure out how can we apply less and get the same or greater yield. In this carbon sustainably produced good climate, uh, you also need to think about your system CI, carbon intensity score. The lower your intensity score, you may your grain may qualify for other markets that gives you a premium on your bushel. When you apply less fertilizer, what happens to your N2O N2 emission? It goes down. What happens to your leaching? It goes down. Now, one of the questions we have not fully explored, but we are funded to explore, uh, Amir and I, is what happens when we add balanza clover uh, to the system? What happens to tile drain nitrate? We're not there yet. Next year, we'll have some, some data, right? <clears throat> so to conclude, you can add 50% lower seeding rate and get the same performance from the cover crop. Balanza clover generated about a, on average 130 pounds per acre of nitrogen within the biomass. It could function as a nitrogen credit depending on your residue management. Are you going to plant green, plant brown? That's your decision. Weather kind of makes that decision for a lot of us. Uh, Balanza clover MRTN for both years is about 150 pounds per acre to get to the same yield as, uh, as the non-cover crop control. And that's about 100 pounds less than uh, cereal rye, okay? It's about 50 pounds less than uh, the control in one of two years. In conclusion, I think that we, we need to think about these overwintering legumes, and this, this, this is from genetics. They've been genetically modified to stand cold. But we still have some uh, adaptive management levers we need to pull in order to get them to perform in all of the altitudes of the state. And so I'll stop there and entertain discussion if there's time.